I'm going to ask um, each of our three uh, fellows um, to offer the mission of the work that they do, the organizations that they founded, as well as their superpower that makes their work successful and that they bring to their work each day. Um, so I, I wonder if we might go ahead and start with Rachel, and then from Rachel, we'll go to Mamie. From Mamie, we'll go to Akisi. And then after that, we'll hear from Sadrina Jalal, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her relationships with these women, her relationship to civic innovation, and the way that she thinks about uh, racial justice, about equity, and about we support the work of um, fellows like those we're about to hear from. Rachel, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Willis. I am the founder and CEO of Elevating Equity. It is an organization that supports educators and leaders in creating anti-racist environment. Um, I think my superpower is that I actually believe that one day in America we can achieve racial justice for everyone. I actually believe that it is possible to bring an end to a system of white supremacy in our laws and in our structures. I actually believe that it is possible for us to create work environments and school environments where people can come and bring their full selves and wear their hair how they want to wear it and uh, like react to conflict as they want to react to it and not have to code switch. And I think it's a superpower because most people are just so despondent at this point of like, ah, oh, it's been like this for 400 years, nothing's gonna change. Um, but my enthusiasm is that I know and I have seen and heard stories of my ancestors and what they have done and how they've slowly made incremental change. And my work at Elevating Equity is just speeding that up over the course of my lifetime. Um, and making sure that we're creating generations of racial justice leaders here in Atlanta and beyond. Thank you, Rachel. And if I didn't know Mamie, I would feel bad that she has to follow you. <laughs> oh, please still feel bad. Please still feel bad. Hello, everybody. My name is Mamie Hart. Again, the founder, I'm working on saying this smoothly, the founder and executive director of Carrie's Closet of Georgia. And our mission is also very simple to where we close and we advocate for the needs of children through advocacy and service. Real simple. Um, and my secret sauce is that some people call me the term queen, right? And I just like to translate that, that I do have an energy um, and a passion that's contagious, because much like my peer, my fellow colleague, I believe that we at Carrie's Closet, we work in the prevent. We believe that a healthy world comes from healthy leaders, and healthy leaders come from a healthy childhood. We want to go from the place of we build from nurturing our truest asset, right? And sometimes that's just making sure that a child doesn't look like the trauma that they have endured. No child should look like sexual abuse. No child should look like physical abuse. No child should look like neglect. Every child should look like their potential. And when we start by truly nurturing the child, we build healthy families, we build healthy communities, and that's how we create social change, right? So that is that is my sauce, that I am truly the children's champion. That's what they call Miss Mamie, and that's what we do. We advocate and we service children, and we do that through making sure they have the clothing on their back that's needed to be successful. Thank you, Mamie. Akisi, can we hear from you? Yep, good afternoon. I am Akisi Stokes, co-founder and CEO of Wonder Grubs. We are an ag tech startup that produces edible, insect protein. Our, our mission is to connect farmers, communities, and businesses to insect protein as a healthy, accessible, and sustainable alternative protein source that is also affordable. And so my superpower would be the group, I think most recently affectionately calls me the plug. So uh, I'm always connecting people. I always know someone. If you need a venue, I'm like, oh yeah, I know a place or I know somebody who can fill that in. And so I think that helps a lot in the, the mission of what we're doing, which is about food justice, about food equity, about inclusivity, and essentially everyone deserves to eat. 
whether you're a millionaire or whether you live in a low to moderate income neighborhood, it shouldn't matter. Everyone should have access to healthy, clean protein to food. Akisi, thank you. Thank you so much. So I, so Sadrina, I feel like this is so rich and I, I don't know that they meant to or not, but they set this up as such that we, we hear from Rachel with this, with this deep belief in and a real belief in racial equity being possible from Mamie, her passion for children as a child advocate and her vision of that connectedness to leaders who incite social change and justice. And then Akisi helping us see that connectivity among people and among change makers is central to making change. So Sadrina, would you talk to us about what it means to be part of supporting these women, having also been a fellow and having come okay. from doing justice work in your own uh, professional past? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it means the world to me um, to share this space with these three beautiful, incredible, um, just dynamic and uh, powerful forces. Um, I, I, it's just, um, it's a dream come true for me, to be quite honest. I, when I started this work, um, as you mentioned, um, I used to run an organization prior to my work with um, with CCI. And, um, you know, I realized just the challenges um, that entrepreneurs face, particularly female entrepreneurs and more specifically black female entrepreneurs, you know, what, you know, we are, what, what we're up against um, because, and I realize it because I've lived it. And, um, and so to hear them speak and they maintain the sub, same level of, of um, belief and um, commitment um, and uh, just, you know, just grit in this work um, really inspires me every single day. Um, so as you said, you know, the Center for Civic Innovation is centered around um, supporting impactful solutions in Atlanta's communities. And um, I just wanna just emphasize that we believe wholeheartedly in leaders just like Mamie, Akisi and Rachel. Um, and, um, and we put, you know, we put our time, our energy, our resources behind that. Um, to to really kind of demonstrate and to model what it means um, to invest in not just impactful solutions, but in leaders who bring a wealth of knowledge, expertise, um, thought leadership, um, as well as commitment and love for our city um, to the table every single day. Thank you, Sadrina. So I'm going to go the other way. Um, with my first question, uh, so beginning with Akisi, I know, so unfair. Akisi's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> never being called first, and now I get called first all the time, so it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Akisi, will you tell us about um, what you see as a connection between the, the work that Wonder Grubs does and uh, and climate justice. Um, I ask because I, I read that part of the origin story of Wonder Grubs um, was your reactions to what displaced families and people were facing in Haiti in the wake of the earthquake there. And so in mm -hmm. thinking about climate justice and injustice, um, the increasing occurrence of events that will displace families um, who are already vulnerable, is there a connection between Wonder Grubs and what you see as sort of the future of food and sustainability and climate justice. Yeah, definitely. So um, the, the quick funny story, my partner and I were watching, co -found, and also co-founder were watching Anthony Bourdain, um, No Reservations, Haiti. And so this was several years after the earthquake. And so just kind of seeing the devastation that it did to arable land. And that's something that people don't think about a lot and that, you know, people aren't fed immediately after a disaster. And, my, and the co-founder, Kareem Nelson, he also is from an island, St. Thomas, and actually lived through Hurricane Hugo, um, which is probably one of the worst ones that has hit the island and so has dealt with, you know, having to water conservation issues. That's my dog, he's chiming in, sorry about that. Um, water conservation issues and things of that nature. And so what we realize is that several years after, it takes the agriculture a long time to come back. It takes the land a long time to regenerate itself. And so what do people do in the meantime? Um, and if you were already on the fringes before a catastrophic event, what happens to you, you know, three or four years thereafter and where you do literally have people eating mud, 
you know, in, in some cases. And so we started thinking about, you know, what is a protein? What is a food that doesn't require a lot of natural resources? You know, what, what is something that can be, that's portable? What is something that's affordable that people can produce themselves or can be produced easily? In a long winding road, we landed on insects. Um, and, and insects for a particular reason, uh, they also, we, just to quote a couple of stats, uh, the U.S. alone, uh, on average each year, uses uh, loses about 4 billion tons of soil to agriculture alone. Uh, we lose about 130 billion tons of water alone from the way that we industrialize agriculture. Uh, and we're, so that results in about a $27 billion loss every single year. And all of the, the protein that's being produced, for example, is not necessarily for food, which is a misnomer. It's for so many other products, tires, detergent, you know, the list goes on and on. So when we talk about the damage we've done to the land in the last just 40 years, um, and you look at insects, insects also can help regenerate. So it's not just about restoring, but also regenerating the soil that has been lost, that hasn't been lost to development. Um, and so really, and also using it when we talk about a circular economy, you know, using an insect allows you to do so many different things. There's so many different touch points down the supply chain. It's hyper local. It's easy, a low entry barrier for someone who needs to um, perhaps generate income for their family. Someone, again, can produce protein on their own for their family. It's something that suppliers can implement, you know, put in supplement as an additive in foods at a very low cost for people. Um, and just bottom line, the way that we're currently operating industrialized agriculture is just not sustainable. It's not a matter of, hey, if we stop producing protein the way we are now, traditionally, we can reverse it. Actually, we can't. So we have to find really creative and innovative ways now for the next 10, 20 years to really reverse the damage that we have done. And so when you talk about food justice, people who are on the fringes, people who lived in what we like to coin as food deserts, you know, where you go 20 to 30 miles before you find a grocery store. And we've driven it and we've proven that. And we've seen evidence of it. And those same people living in corridors of food swamps where there's a plethora, you know, people look at why are people who are obese still malnutritioned? You know, how is that possible? You know, how do they still have chronic disease, but they're quote unquote fat or living large? That's because you're eating large calories of poor nutrition food, you know, food that has poor nutrition, um, high sugar, a lot of carbs. Um, and so people are eating just poor quality food. And so again, we're talking about an insect that's a clean protein. You're already eating an insect anyway. FDA allows it, just so you know, partially <laughs> in your food. So we've already eaten a bug. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but us finding just creative ways to introduce it into the market. Uh, and so when you talk about, again, how it affects climate change, these are areas that are disproportionately affected by, you know, a loss of land, um, a loss of income, um, pollution from manufacturing firms that are producing these high calorie foods, you know, so it's a vicious cycle. Um, so that's how we feel as though it ties in. Just kind of a, a quick overview. Akisi, thank you. Uh, if you don't know what hyperlocal means or what a circular economy is, <laughs> or how delicious an insect protein is. I am telling you right now, you need to get Googling on Wonder Grubs. Uh, but Ikisi, thank you. That was that was basically an amazing kind of mini primer in systems thinking that helps us all wrap our minds around what does what we eat or what we have the privilege of eating have to do with a really big picture around climate justice, around displacement, and around foreseeing and making real a sustainable future. So thank you. Um, I think, and, and I love going to Mamie now because I think, you know, Mamie, you help us think also about systems and about the way that reorienting what we see and who we see can lead to systems change. So I would love to know if local and state and national policymakers were really paying attention to the experiences of foster children, what would change? Hmm. Um, our primary purpose of Carrie's Closet was to be a direct service link for those children in need who are in foster care that are not given basic rights of clothing, meaning for those who are listening. A child could be sexually molested by her mother's 
boyfriend and be removed on site. There is nowhere lit, written in Georgia's law that she is granted the right to get her clothing from her mother or from her home. She is just simply placed from one area to another. Now, there are safeguards within foster care. Sure, you have a stipend, but we don't know when that stipend may come. If leadership were truly aware of how we are treating our children, one, we would fix our language. We cannot safely say that we believe children are our future, but we don't have anything written in law to protect their innocence, right? Another thing that I've learned, um, and I hate to pivot back to that first question of what's your secret sauce. While Carrie's closet is not, I've changed the wording from basic to foundational work, direct service is foundational work, advocacy came from direct service. Everybody who is listening, everybody who's on this line was once a child. Carrie's closet and the work that we do ties in not just policymakers, it ties in your grassroots, it ties in your professional, it ties in, it ties everyone in together to their childhood. Now, if our persons in charge, right, not only were their language changed, but I think their actions would change. What did you not have in your childhood that you don't want for anyone else, right? There are many of us that are in positions that have totally disconnected from their childhood, whether good or bad. What we do as Carrie's Closet, we're saying that everyone should at least have equal footing, if nothing else but with clothing. So I'm actually very excited to share that we are not just serving foster care kids anymore. We're also servicing children in detention centers, right, who are coming out that need clothing. We're serving our children in domestic shelters that mamas had to leave. And if I have to get my purse or pamper bag, I got to get my purse. We're helping those kids. Our kids that are identified as LGBTQA, that have been beaten and forced out of their homes into shelter, shelter, we clothe those children. And then, of course, our, our refugee identified children and foster care kids, those five tenants of children. When our leadership realizes that they were once children too, and tapped into that innate feeling of needing to be protected and offer that extension of compassion to other children, I think we, we would be able to address some of the issues that we have now. Why? Because I would be able to see my experience as your experience. And because my experience may have been good, I, I want the same for you. I will be able to say, pull yourself up from your bootstraps, right? Because as a leader, maybe I realize that I didn't have a boot to strap up, right? And because that was my traumatic experience, I'm gonna make sure that you have one better than me. I really, really, whoever is listening on the line, I really want us to tap into our childhood and what it meant for your development. And there is a reason why uh, there is now a focus on mental health in early childhood. There is a reason why education is more leaning funding towards early childhood. It's because it matters. It matters to who we become as a community. It matters to who we become as a nation. And if Care's Closet does nothing else, we're going to tap into that childhood, even if it's by giving you a jacket, even if it's by offering you shoes. And I think not only is that our secret sauce, I think that's what makes our mission powerful because everybody can participate. So that would be how I think we could tie that in. Healthy children create healthy leaders. Healthy leaders create healthy communities. And healthy communities overall create a healthy world and nation. Preach, Mamie. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love the way that you talk about, you talk about policy change in terms that are incredibly and deeply human and humane. And I, I, I don't think we can overstate how important that is, you know? And I didn't know um, if, if I could speak about the Foster Child Bill of Rights. I didn't know if that was appropriate for the time. Um, but I do want to make sure that we are aware that Georgia does not have a foster child bill of right. There are 17 states that have safeguards for children in foster care and Georgia is not one. Um, we are working to address that, but I wanted to make sure I was kind of being pure to why I was, you know, here. Um, but working not just direct service, but making sure that we actually have laws that make sure we make children our future is honestly our passion. Thank you, Mamie. Um, 
Rachel, I, this in many ways follows some of what Mamie's sharing, but I, I would love it if you could offer us some of your insights about or some strategies around from your work with Elevating Equity, how to address exacerbating inequity in the context of COVID-19 for school children. Yeah. So I think uh, what we have seen with COVID-19 is a, really an awakening for people of issues that were always there that now can no longer be hidden bare if it doesn't directly impact you. Um, from a health standpoint, we have seen COVID-19 disproportionately impact Black and Indigenous communities across the country. Um, and as Akisi mentioned, a lot of that doesn't actually have anything to do with DNA. It comes from what do they have access to. Um, but specifically, it's because those communities are the ones that are living in closest proximity to environmental racism um, and have been exposed to things that have brought on pre what are now pre-existing conditions that have made COVID-19 more possible for them to have and to make it um, just more disabling to the ability for them to continue. And I think what we do in education is that in some instances, we have people who have the opportunity and the privilege to create clusters for families um, where there are pods being created across the city so that I can take my child and on Monday and Tuesday, they might be at this house and learning with this family, and then I can take over Wednesday and Thursday. Um, but that's not something that is possible for every person. Um, and what I'm seeing also is that in many communities that are rural, there isn't even virtual learning happening. It's very much distance learning. The school bus is taking written packets that teachers might get back the next week and might not. Um, and so we have to account for everything from how structural racism, uh, things like redlining of our school neighborhoods, things like property taxes being involved in the funding of schools and education, how that's mm -hmm. actually playing out in the opportunities that our students have now, and then how do we cope with it? Um, so one of the things that I've been working with educators around is we're very strong at creating plans uh, for how do we respond if there's a fire drill? What do we do if there's a tornado in our school? And we know it like the back of our hand. But what we don't know how to do is how do we respond to racial violence? How do we respond to moments like mm -hmm. now where all of these inequities are coming to light. What is our plan within our schoolhouse if no one is coming to save us? Um, and so that has really been a pivot that I've worked on with school leaders and educators, not just in Atlanta, but across the country around how are we going to make do? What does that look like? And what does it look like to not just be an academic leader within our classrooms, but to see ourselves actually as racial justice leaders? What are the things we have to interrogate to Mamie's point about our own childhood? Um, because racism is something that is learned over time. We're actually cognizant of um, how different races are treated as early as two and three years old. And so we have to stop, start unpacking, like what messages have we internalized over time? What were some of the things that I actually just need to let that go? That was somebody else's junk that has been hindering me and coming into my full humanity, um, and what do I need to replace it with? Um, so a big portion of Elevating Equity's work is just educating people and creating spaces for folks to attend workshops where they have the opportunity to think about what was my childhood? Where did those messages start? What did I see in my curriculum and what did I not see in my curriculum and on television that has informed how I view the world and how is that still playing out? How does that change how I interact with people and my implicit biases and how that um, interfaces with people who I manage um, or students that I teach? Um, all the way to how does it play out into our institutional laws and our policies and practices and even things that we say, like Mamie said, pulling each other up from the bootstraps and just giving people the opportunity to understand, like, that's a characteristic of individualism. Three-fourths of the world's population, particularly people of color, come from collectivist culture. So we need to be thinking about how can we come together as a family? Um, and what would it look like if we prioritize kinship and community over individual success? Um, so this has really been a good time where I feel like for the last four years, Elevating Equity has been trying to like 
prove the point of why achieving racial equity is important and why you need it. Um, and everything since COVID-19 to George Floyd um, has really brought it to the surface where folks are like, yep, I know what to do now. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and I, I want to quickly shout out, Rachel has a beautiful blog post. It is actually from some time ago. It's from 2016, but um, she's offering a kind of reflection on the way that what our children read influences how they understand power and race and equity in the world. And so she offers some resources for what um, to what to read your children. And um, and so I just ordered some of those books for my son today. So thank you. Rachel. I love that. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> um, and, and I think we have a, an audience question that is for everybody. Um, and I think maybe, Sadrina, we'll go to you first with it. Um, and then we can sort of uh, kind of see what the communal uh, energy brings. So, so this is a great question. Um, the, the query starts with how have you, recent events, the pandemic and a renewed focus on racial injustice, how have these events influenced the way that you operate as entrepreneurs and as leaders? Specifically, do you see the promise of things getting better, more access to funding, more attention to the issues you care about, more support? Mm. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, I, I appreciate this question so much because as I was listening um, to um, each of these leaders speak, I just, um, again, blown away by, um, you know, the fact that they live, eat, sleep, dream this work. And that has been the case um, since before COVID and before we had all this focus, you know, that we currently have on racial injustice in our country. Like, this is not new for us at all. Um, and while it is really um, good to see that more people have joined the conversation and that we have kind of um, an energy that's building, um, you know, I have some concern about the sustained effort part of this um, and rather or not, you know, the, um, the excitement or the energy or the commitment will stay um, beyond, you know, the next couple of months or even the next few years. Um, what I will say is that I think that these leaders are up for the challenge. How CCI's work has um, changed or has been impacted um, by, by recent events um, really is revolved around the work of these leaders and supporting them in very direct ways. Um, this summer, we um, we heard loud and clear um, that um, just that, you know, it's unfortunately the case that when we have a focus on uh, racial racism and racist practice, practices and institutions, that black women are usually the ones that are called to lead these um, conversations and do the work. And so not only have so many of us been, um, you know, asked to speak on behalf of our communities while we are guiding the work, we are also asked to maintain our households, our families, to, um, you know, to show up for, you know, our neighbors, um, our, our, our church family, just in so many ways. And so, you know, we made a decision very early at CCI that we were going to, you know, really pour in as much as we could into the leaders because we wanted first and foremost, for them to feel like they had what they needed to continue um, to show up in the ways that they wanted to continue. And also, you know, we wanted to provide a safe place um, for, for, the, for the collaboration and the networking efforts that we know that they naturally do, you know, on their own. And to, uh, to Rachel's point, like, you know, I think it's really important that we consider that some of the best work is, in, is done um, collectively. It's not in isolation. It's not an individual experience. And particularly for Black women, you know, we are nurturers and we do well nurturing and taking care of each other. And so, you know, it was very important to me personally, having been in the position that um, that these ladies um, have been in, in terms of being a leader of an organization and having some of those challenges, to, to not just say, okay, let's you know, let's let's offer care and support, but let's recognize that the way that you lead 
is inspiring and it is something that you know needs to be celebrated. So we spent time in celebration, we spent time in rest and support and really following the lead this summer of our leaders. Yeah. <laughs> um, so who would like to build on that? I think Sadrina just offered us a lot. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I have to realize I got to monitor my tongue, so I won't embarrass my mama. Hey, mama, she watch. <laughs> I will be able to answer that question on Wednesday, November fourth. That's the day after the election. I think our culture has made it cute to pimp off of other people's pain or progression. Black Lives Matter. I had to wake up black. I go uh, sleep and wake up again. I'm going to be black. That's that's my name. I have had to operate in this space. It's not triggering for me anymore, unfortunately, to see black men die or black women raped in police brutality and engagement. My pause at this point is when do my, my majority peers have their politics match their principle. Do not hold my hand and tell me I, I grieve with you and your people. I understand what it's like to be at a, you know, to have challenge and struggle, but yet you boost and vote against my humanity. Vote in alignment with politicians who will not receive stim. That does not coincide. That does not match. It does not agree. So I I, I hear all the I see all the love and I appreciate the temporary funding, right? Because this isn't going to be an ongoing thing. Let's keep that honest. But I really want to know when do our politics match? And if you're a true ally of what's going on in our country right now, we will see on November 4th. That is a bold statement, but that's a real one. We don't have to be told anymore that politics and voting matters. It really does. And my last point to that, Black women's intellect must be honored as their service. Do not take my idea now that COVID is here, because I'm going to make another bold statement. Folks weren't driving around in cars giving off clothing. They weren't. Mamie, do you have another pair of shoes? Da, da, da. So I see everybody doing it now that we're in COVID. Hello, one group I'm talking about. So it was okay to listen to me give the pitch, but when it came to actually execution, you didn't trust me enough to do that. So to speak on that question again, Black women aren't just good to serve, we're good in thought, we're good in intellect, we're good in cognitive ability to execute. And I may say that aggressively, and don't get me started on that. But I'm saying that with a certain level of force and frustration that you will have black women in private conversations, suck the intellect and creativity from them, and then you will execute it with your homeboys that you that you graduated with from Georgia. And that's not fair. I want us to be consistent in how we vote and how we engage in intellect. Thank you, Mamie. Akisi. For the record, for the record, Mamie and I both went to Georgia. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'm always loving any on UGA. It's we love it. It feeds us. <laughs> so, so, of course, I'm going to have to big up Emery. Emery in the house, undefeated. So, um, <laughs> forever undefeated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so for us, I know earlier, Ruth, you know, you asked about the work we're doing in respect to climate change, but the, the which was which is one of our goals, but our primary goal is the work around food justice. And so, you know, in the current climate, you know, as Sadrina and Mamie and Rachel so poignantly hit on, you know, COVID just exacerbated issues that have always existed that were already there, you know, and so now it's just you can't ignore it, <laughs> you know, it's a pandemic. And so with that, for us, we are very strategic about, you know, what technology and how it is, you know, horticulture is the last digitization, you know, area to be digitized. 
And so we're very clear when we go to conference, we're very clear when we go into tech spaces that sometimes my co-founder and I are the only one of two there or the only one of five there, you know, and sometimes there are very few women there and even less black women, you know. And so when we talk about technology and advancement and innovative and knowledge based jobs and when we talk about the chasm that keeps growing between urban and rural, when we talk about grocery stores won't come into certain neighborhoods, you know, disproportionately is happening to black and brown and Native American, you know, and the list goes on and on. And so, you know, I've heard people say a lot of times, you know, well, the food supply chain, you know, the food systems are just broken. No, they're not broken. They're designed to do absolute. They're doing exactly what they were designed to do, you know, and so and so for leading by profits. If we're not taking all factors into consideration, there are people who are not getting left behind. They've already been left behind where people are having to choose between a food and a light bill. You know, so and this is not just black and brown. It's black and brown in urban areas. But if you go outside into rural communities where I'm originally from, it's poor white faces. You know, so um, so we need to have a larger conversation about making, you know, systemic policy, long term, long term changes, you know, as Mamie speaks to. And so I think oftentimes, especially when people are heightened, you know, with fear, um, the go to is trying to handle the symptom. You know, so there are some groups doing wonderful work in feeding people. But how do people get to that that situation in the first place? You know, so I want to have those conversations. Why is the food supply chain so vulnerable that within a month, you know, organizations are having to pull together resources to feed not just children, families. So why are there families? Why are there parents in that situation? Why do those jobs not exist? Why do they not have the income to be able to afford basic needs? You know, and so why are farmers burning their surplus? Why, why, why is there not a supply chain that helps support them and getting food to people who need it? You know, so there's some large gaping holes and we need to make a complete paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. You know, so for us, when we talk about insects feeding people, we've been called by the shark tanks. You know, we've been called by investors who want to keep the paradigm the same. I don't want a massive, you know, 50,000, 70,000 square foot warehouse that only 10 people work at because it's fully automated and you're in a community that's not being fed, that's not working and is not being reskilled. So this is a long term. This is not just, you know, it's again, disproportionately affecting people who look a certain way in certain areas, but it is a cutting a, a, against a cross section of Americans that are currently hidden um, and sometimes are voting against themselves. And so we need to have some real uncomfortable, continuous conversations. And so again, for us, it's about eating. So regardless of what else you do, if you're not eating, you're gonna starve, you're gonna die. Yeah. And when we lose those people physically, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, and we, we keep saying we're not a third world country. In some degrees we are. And we need to wake up to that reality and have some real conversations about where we are headed. Um, from a humanitarian standpoint as a nation. Uh, Akisi, thank you. Um, another really, really beautiful systems tutorial for us to think about um, access to food as a way to understand greater systemic injustices that we're all, that we're all contemplating maybe more deeply and figuring out how do we support the work that's already happening? Um, and and I have a bunch of questions here. I want to go to Rachel with this kind of um, condensed an effort at condensing these questions. And this is you guys are you guys knew this was coming. I know you knew it was coming. But this is this is the question, right? This is um about what what are the what are the ways? And and Rachel, I'm I'm asking you first because you're the language. And elevating equity is essentially around how do we adopt new practices or interventions that change culture. Um, and so the questions are about how do I contribute to a more equitable community? Uh, how do I support the work of people who are doing that? How do I start hard conversations? And how do I do that in places where maybe that there's there's an inhospitable environment? So I, I wanted to go to you first and see if you might offer us. Um, from from the depth of your wisdom around elevating equity, some insight there. 
Ooh, that's that's a whole eight hours. All those questions we could we could be here all day. Um, so I'm gonna do a one. I saw it pop up in the Q and A, and I was like, "Ooh, I like that one." Um, <laughs> and it was um from the lens of like, what do you do? How like how do you bring this around to uh, when you're seeing something um, within a corporate setting or a public board perspective? Um, and so I just want to introduce. Two really cute things that you can say uh, that is going to stop and have people thinking, um, but will also keep you safe um, because sometimes we are often the people who are marginalized within institutions and we are the ones who have to speak up as well. Um, so two key phrases I want everybody to memorize. The first one is, I'm noticing. So maybe it is. I'm noticing that your board isn't reflective of the communities that you serve. I'm wondering, is the second one, I'm wondering what your strategy is for making a more diverse board. Or here's another way it could sound. I'm noticing as I look on your website that people of color are only in entry level positions at your organization. I'm wondering what this tells people about your dedication to your mission and the people that you serve. I'm also wondering what this tells people of color about their ability to have leadership growth within your organization. And so you just kind of like dropped a bomb right there. And I don't know if y'all saw Mamie's reaction. She was like, oh. And so that is how people feel, too. It's either a, I didn't notice that, and now I'm wondering the same thing, or I noticed it, and I don't want to change. And that's going to give you the power to understand, like, who do I rock with? Who do I not rock with? Um, and if you're not rocking with them, being very explicit about it and why. Um, I think in terms of getting involved in this work, one of the biggest things is just starting locally. And when I say that, I don't mean Atlanta. I don't mean Georgia Tech. I mean, like, what's your parents talking about? What are your aunts and your sisters saying that you need to check them for? Um, I had to have conversations with my family members, my parents, my brother-in-law, my family friends where just like inappropriate stuff was said or jokes were made and I'm like, oh, that's not funny. And yeah, that's hard. Everybody else at the table is laughing, but like, it's not funny. So let's talk about why it's not funny. And then let's talk about how that marginalized people. And let me make a comparison to what that would sound like if someone were to make a similar statement about us as black people. And now let's not say that again. And can you pass the sweet potato casserole? You did a good job. Thank you. So I think being very conscious of like getting ourselves in the habit of checking the people who are around us versus being like, oh, my God, I don't like who they voted for. I don't like what news station they watch. I'm just not going to their house for Thanksgiving. No, you about to get up in that house and have some conversations because I can't be in that house for you. And so we start locally. But then we also are conscious and aware within the settings where we work, the organizations that we interact with of like. What do I notice? What do I wonder? Um, and then what do I need to do about it? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I love I love that. And I'm going to make practicing that a personal meditation. Um, we Southern white ladies who don't like conflict need to get on the horn. You better come on, Ruthie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Rachel, you're offering some really, I mean, these are really, really great because they're really specific. Um, are there, how, Akisi, Sadrina, Mamie, how would you um, build on that from your own perspectives? Um, or is there a different direction that you would like to take these questions, which are about essentially, how do I organize for social change? How do I support greater justice? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I keep I would, number one, my CCI sister Rachel, that was a high five for you, sis. Um, but I do, I do want to pose the question: Is why do we have to enter these conversations, viewing it as challenging? Um, mm -hmm. With the mental health background, we call it courageous conversations. You've got to have courage to show up for these conversations. They're courageous conversations. They're human conversations. 
Um, but for me, uh, I always learned that service is free. We, we need to demystify what social justice looks like. You don't have to be on Capitol Hill. You don't have to have a PhD. We need to quit making advocacy this, uh, this type of prestigious being. You can simply serve at the soup kitchen. You could lean into those organizations that need your left and Mrs. Right and actually do the work, right? But the challenge for call on social action is if you know that you lean more towards um, helping kids all the time and you do it in Douglasville, can you take that same service to a different dem demographic, maybe in DeKalb or in Clayton County? Can you do it for maybe some of my Latinx and Hispanic families in Gwinnett? Can you serve differently. And that is my push. You don't necessarily have to make this social change and cute systems work and all of that. Can you serve differently so that you're still creating the impact that is desired for continual change? And that would just be the only thing that I would add. So I don't want to take up all the time, but I love the conversation. Thank you, Mamie. Akisi? I like that. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I love these ladies so much. Um, Rachel, I like that. You have the uncomfortable conversation and pass the sweet potatoes. And, and as Mamie mentioned, you're you're already people are doing as Mamie mentioned, you're you're doing the work in various small ways every day. You know, just reaching out to your neighbor, asking questions. And like the work we do, you know, my co-founder and, and and life partner reminds me all the time. He was like, you don't have to overcomplicate it. Um, just keep it simple. You know, a lot of times you want to push down agendas and missions, and we have to be careful we don't do that ourselves to people and simply ask people what they want, ask people what they need, and they will tell you. And, and so, you know, when Mamie talks about, you know, these systems that we create, um, it doesn't have to be something elaborate. You know, you don't have to spend, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there was one park that was built on the west side that cost a million dollars. We still can't figure out where the million dollars went. It looks like a $5,000 park, you know, so, so don't overcomplicate it, you know, keep it, keep it, keep it simple. And, and I like when Rachel talks about having those conversations, there's something to, to be said about civic, you know, CCI is about civic engagement. There, it's okay to have healthy discourse, you know, and so not only are we teaching children that, but adults need to be comfortable just having a conversation. We don't have to agree about everything, but we can agree to be civil and be civic mm -hmm. and have a conversation. And it may not take one conversation. It may not take one month. It may take a couple of years before something hits or triggers for someone. Let that be okay and continue on with your mission. I mean, I guess that's the only other thing that I would add. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Akisi. I love y'all. <laughs> I know I, I'm I'm Tim, I'm getting you know the like the kind of clock from from Dory um, and I'm like no nah, how about two more hours we're good <laughs> um but but to the to the point of kind of thinking about what we might be able to ooh somebody brought you <laughs> <laughs> the other half of Wonder Girls <laughs> <laughs> nice um we would love. And this is how every impact um, series event ends. We would love to hear a uh, call to action from each of you about what you would like to leave us with. Um, and we will uh, start with Sidrina and then work our way around. Well, I'll just kind of build my call to action from everything that um, was just said as it relates to, you know, just how we can embody um, and um, affect change. Um, in the spaces that we occupy. You know, I, I wanna say start with you. I think that what I see a lot of is um, folks um, assuming that their work involves educating others or having difficult conversations with their family members. And um, I think that, you know, a lot of folks can benefit from reading some really good books and mm -hmm. looking internally. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think about just in my own circles, I have some really incredible white girlfriends that I adore. And when, you know, George Floyd happened, they came to me, what can I do? And I'm like, did you read how to be an anti-racist? Like I told you to a year ago. Oh, you haven't? Don't talk to me. Like we can't talk. 
And because before you start talking about what you can do, we need to address some of the layers of um, issues that you present in the way that you do things. And so, and these are people that I love. So, <laughs> but I, you know, I definitely think that we need to first assume that we are part of the problem. And that's not just to white people. I mean, that is all, we all have a responsibility in um, addressing this and in learning how to be an anti-racist. I think is super, super important. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, we cannot put enough emphasis um, on civic engagement to Akisi's point. So yes, be involved. National mm -hmm. politics are important, but what's happening in your community? Who, what is the leadership like in your community? What's happening at your neighborhood association, at your NPU? You know, what's the development that's taking place? What are the policies, the procedures that are impacting people in your space that you don't even know exist? You know, who are those powerful people? So I really would just encourage folks to just take a look at, at their behavior. Um, that was mentioned earlier, as well as their 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 politics and their actions before they look outward. Uh, Rachel, will you do us the honor of being next? Yeah. Um, so in terms of what can we do, what is our call to action? Um, I personally would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge today that the city of Louisville um, made the announcement to not indict anyone for the murder of Breonna Taylor. Um, and so my call to action tonight is to pray for her mother, Tamika Palmer, to pray for her boyfriend and survivor of that killing as well, um, Kenneth Walker. Um, and to remember that even though Breonna Taylor may not be someone who we know personally as Black Americans, she's us. As a black woman, she is our sister. She is someone who could have been a mother who will never have that opportunity. She could have been our sister-in-law across the table at holidays. Um, she could have been our best friend. She could have been the EMT who came to save our life. Um, and that did not happen. And the weight of that is very heavy on black America, but on black women in particular. Um, and there's actually a name for that, and it's called secondary racial trauma. You might often hear it called as vicarious racism as well. It is when something did not directly impact you, but you are grieving and mourning that loss at the same time. And so that is going to cause black women, black Americans across the country and allies to have a sense of grief tomorrow morning when it is time to log on to Zoom. Um, and to carry that weight and to have to put on a mask. Um, and so my call to action mm -hmm. is to know that we are wearing a mask um, and to know that we don't want to wear it anymore. That mask has been on for Breonna Taylor, for Ahmaud Aubrey, for George Floyd, for Eric Garner, for Tamir Rice, for Sandra Bland, and on and on and on. But it also mm -hmm. has been on since our first ancestor came onto this continent. And so my call to action is that you find out what you can do within your own circle, within your own self, to make sure that we can take off the mask. And mm -hmm. one way to do that is to make sure that when you vote in November, that you do not mm -hmm. vote because you are pro-birth, but you vote because you are pro-life, because you care not what happens just to a fetus, but what happens to that child that Mamie has to clothe, to that person who Akisi has to make sure has food, to that woman who grows up and is just trying to make sure that she can make it in a corporate environment. And so I ask mm -hmm. that we vote for life, but life meaning every single instant from the time you come out of the womb so that you don't have to leave Earth early like Brianna did. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for the eighth time i'm so glad this is being recorded that was incredible <laughs> um thank you for that invocation and blessing and um and call to action um akisi um a call to action from me would be to treat to 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 maybe purposely maybe just one one day one hour out of the week over the course of the next year as you head into 2021 think about a way that you can have connect with a stranger 
and think about being civil to others as an instance of self-care. So think about civility as self-care. Um, as Mamie mentioned earlier, and I think all of the women have touched on one another, we agree with one another or not. Um, the way that we begin trying to understand one another or volunteer or help someone out only makes, again, as Mamie said earlier, our country, our nation, our neighborhood stronger. And think of that as an instance of self-care. That child that you don't help, that woman that you don't help, that person that you don't speak up for, that uncomfortable conversation that you don't have, could very well in some ways circle back to how it transforms your community, good or bad, how it transforms your city, good or bad, how it transforms your nation, good or bad. So think about how you help or don't help others as self-care. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that That is a beautiful call to action. Um, Mamie, will you uh, bring us to a, to a, a reluctant conclusion, at least? I'm <laughs> sure. Um, thank you, first off, um, everyone, for this wonderful um, conversation. Um, I do want to say that I am dealing with an emergency with a foster care child now on the phone. Um, so no, I wasn't asleep. I'm thinking about how I'm going to manage this. But it goes back to <laughs> um, the thought of if we all tapped into our childhood, what the world would look like. That's your first call to action. If you want, if you had a good childhood, I want you to want that for everybody. And make sure that your politics match your principles and how you vote. And lastly, trust black women trust our intellect not just what we can do for you and if we are not in the room where a decision is being made you have either created the wrong room or you're in one pick your poison but you don't have to stay there go find that black woman who has the intellect not just the service and invite her to the table defend our honor even when we're not there and that's all i gotta give Thank you, Mamie. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Akisi. Thank you, Sadrina. I am so grateful for your example and for your wisdom and extremely moved by what you guys have shared tonight. I think everyone who has had the privilege of listening to you is moved by you. I'm handing it back over to Dory and thank you all so much again for what you are building in Atlanta and what you are building in community tonight um, among us. So thank you so much, um, Dory, uh, handing it back over to you.